All right, a couple things I wanted to do here real quick before we get started. Um, as a reminder, your three-day diet analysis project is due this weekend. Remember, you need to have at least one weekday day and one weekend day as part of your three days. So the absolute latest you can start this is tomorrow. I'm going to be grading this pretty much strictly off of the rubric. So this here, the Bio 319R three-day diet analysis project, that's your rubric. That is going to look like this. Make sure, again, that you include these three things. So you have the, uh, the diet analysis worksheet, which is one of the attachments, the eating behavior journal, which is one of the attachments. So worksheet, eating behavior journal, and then the combination report from Cengage. So that's located right in the actual MindTap software that you're gonna to use to track your diet. If you don't include all three of those, then you get an automatic zero. So this is something that's across the board for all the sections. It's all graded the same way since this is the kind of capstone project you have for this class. So make sure before you submit your assignment that you check the rubric that you have hit everything you need to do. Remember, for any of these where it says to list other stuff, make sure you only list things. First off, if you didn't meet the criteria for it. So for example here, if you did not meet the recommended amount of fiber, then you need to list three foods that you would be willing to eat regularly that have at least three or more grams of fiber per serving. But if you did meet the amount of fiber that you needed, don't put anything here. So don't do extra work that you don't need to because it can actually only hurt you. If you were to say, meet this, the fiber requirement, but then put inappropriate foods, like say you put foods that had one or two grams of fiber per serving, you're gonna get points taken off for that. Same thing with the vitamins and minerals. You don't need to discuss deficiencies and toxicities if you didn't meet the deficiency or toxicity requirement. So remember, for a deficiency or toxicity for this, under 70% of your DRI is a deficiency, over 200% of your DRI is a toxicity. Now, yes, I know that that's not necessarily toxic in the case of most everything that we're gonna be doing, but just for the distinction of this assignment, if you are above 200 or below 70% of your, of your DRI, then you have to discuss why. Make sure that you are including at least three eating behaviors and that you have five total SMART goals. Again, one of the things that students miss repeatedly on the SMART goal section is they will do something like this. Where they will make one goal, but list every letter in SMART as its own separate thing. You need to make sure that you have the full SMART goal for each one of these. So make sure you have five SMART goals. Remember the general format for a SMART goal, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time sensitive. You need to have some sort of quantifiable component to it and you need a time limit on it. So for example, over the next week, I will make sure that I eat at least one whole orange to increase my vitamin C intake. And then make sure you include a reference list. If it's not perfect APA format, I'm not too worried. Just make sure that you include whatever references you used. These reputable sources are available to you. You can use these as part of your references. Just make sure that you are including a reference list. And anywhere that you are 
seeing that a reputable source is needed, make sure this is where you would put your in-text citation bit there. Does that all make sense? You don't have to submit everything as one document, but again, you need those three different components there. So again, you need the combination report, the eating behavior journal, and the diet analysis worksheet. So 125 points, 12 and a half percent of your grade. Want to make sure went over that in enough detail for you. All right, next week you have what was supposed to be a CLC, but again, because there's only a handful of you, it's gonna be an individual project. But this is a special population brochure. So I brought a few examples from past classes that you all can look at. So you can kind of pass those around. Now, you don't need to actually print off an actual brochure, but what you're doing here is you are creating really an informational trifold, so six panels worth of information that will discuss how you would treat someone nutritionally that doesn't abide by a traditional apparently healthy adult diet. This can be any population that has, say, either specific dietary requirements for, say, like performance. It could be um, dietary requirements to treat the disease. It can be cultural requirements, religious requirements. Anything that's not a quote unquote typical diet is what is gonna be considered a special population. Now, you can do, like I said, any real topic you want. These are all a big list of potential ones that you can look at doing. You don't have to stick to this. You can pick really whatever you want, as long as it's not just a regular diet kind of thing. You do have to get approval from me for your topic. So make sure you send me a message telling me what you want to do, because I only want to have one person doing each one. Like I said, you don't have to print out a brochure like I'm showing you here. That was just some examples that, um, like I said, students did in the past. So bigger classes, I had them present it. The way you should structure this. So if you look at the instructions here, it gives you a whole kind of list of really suggestions for what you should do. Here's what I would suggest you do. Write, well, type, I guess, would probably be the easiest. If you're typing, make sure it's no more greater than one page, front and back. So whatever the um, word setting will be for a brochure, use that. Don't go any lower than an eight point font. So I don't want you to be making it so I have to magnify it intensely just to read a word. Write in bulleted points or write in phrases. Don't write in paragraph form. That'll not only make it easier to conserve space, but also to get your point across. You wanna make this look like a brochure. You know, a typical brochure isn't filled with text. It's much more visual. So make sure you're including more visuals. You want to make sure you include an overview of your population so you want to hit the broad points of what makes this population unique. You want to include what their dietary requirements are. So things that maybe typically they would and wouldn't eat. You want to include nutritional concerns for them. So for example, if you were talking about say, um, veganism, you would want to discuss, 
you know, ways to say, get protein that's non-animal sourced, because that could be a concern for someone who is a vegan. And then you want to include example foods or meal ideas that may be applicable or appropriate to your population. Now, you do want to have a reference list. You don't need to do any in-text citations for this. You should include a reference list, but include that separate. So don't include that on the brochure itself, just because I want to give you more space. Now, if for some reason, I guess you were needing more content, I guess you could include a ref your reference list on the brochure, but I would prefer you fill your brochure with your content and include your reference list separate. Any questions on that? Do what? You should, but I'm not going to I'm not going to really be docking you major points or anything if you didn't use the textbook. What I'm more concerned about is that you use quality sources. See, like I said, in, in bigger classes, we would follow this kind of to a T, but smaller classes, a lot more malleability there. But I'm much more concerned about the quality of your source material than you use just strictly the book or something like that. All right, so that is going to, again going to be due next Sunday. So that's going to be due Sunday the 13th, 50 points. So that's a, you know, 5% of your grade there. And then in two weeks, you got your final exam. So this will be on MindTap as well. And uh, 150 points for that, 58 questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, depending on how far we get next week, I'm either going to review on Thursday or I'll host a separate review for everyone um, for that there. So I haven't quite decided, but I will review with you there. Now I'm actually going to increase your time. So you're gonna get an hour and 45 minutes to do this. So what would be a full class period, but make sure you get that done by December 20th. So that's two weeks from this upcoming Sunday. All right, any questions on any of that. So that is our schedule for the rest of the year, down to our last two weeks. All right, so now I want to get into topic seven here, which is our life cycle nutrition. So this is going to cover chapters 15 through 17. Today, I'm going to primarily make sure we get through um, chapter 15. Next week, I'm planning on covering 16 and 17. So we got out early on Tuesday's class, so hopefully the same thing happens here for you all. All right, so what we mean by life cycle nutrition is just how your nutritional requirements change throughout your lifetime. So we're starting with pregnancy and gestation and we finish with death. So nice, you know, morbid way to finish the semester. We've talked somewhat about nutrition and pregnancy before, 
more in the case of like specifics in terms of individual micronutrients that are required, things like that. Uh, but now we're gonna go through kind of a bit a more broad overview of really everything that's required here for pregnancy and gestation. All right, so what we have to look at first is not so much like the how you become pregnant, but kind of the what kind of role nutrition plays in that prior to it. Now, typically speaking, you're not going to know that you're pregnant from the moment of conception. It really doesn't happen that way. It's usually several weeks later that you find out. And as we'll see here, once you actually find out you're pregnant, you've already passed through a couple of the critical periods of fetal development. So whenever you are trying to become pregnant or have a suspected pregnancy, what you put in your body becomes extremely critical or crucial, I should say. Anyone that's trying to become pregnant should try to have a I don't want to say this inappropriately, but like a better BMI. So if you are attempting to become pregnant and you are either severely underweight or severely overweight or obese, it makes conception a lot more difficult. Additionally, you want to start with increasing your micronutrient intake before conception occurs. So you may have heard of like taking prenatal vitamins and those are actually pretty important for this overall process. The one big one, remember the one major micronutrient that all pregnant women should be taking is folate or folic acid. You need at least 400 micrograms of that a day to prevent neural tube defects. That's the major one you'll see there. The other one we'll look at is iron. So iron is another big one, and we'll see how that plays a role a little bit later on. Typically, the healthier you are prior to pregnancy, the healthier you'll be during pregnancy and kind of vice versa. Now, this isn't foolproof. It doesn't mean that somebody that isn't perfectly healthy can't have complications, and it doesn't mean that somebody that's terribly unhealthy, can't have an easy pregnancy. But generally speaking, healthier you are prior to pregnancy, usually the less complications you have. You also need to look at age as that also plays a big role in fetal development. And age of the mother is what I mean there. So when a fetus develops, Obviously, it's all within the uterus or in utero. But a fetus doesn't really have to do anything on their own. Everything is provided from the mother via the umbilical blood vessels. So everything from your nutrients to waste disposal to oxygen, all really comes in through the umbilical cord. A fetus doesn't breathe for themselves because they're, the amniotic sac is filled with amniotic fluid, so they're essentially swimming around in there. So this is where your diet and nutrition plays an awful big role because the mother directly influences virtually all development of the fetus. So here's just your, generally speaking, total 
typical gestational periods here. The typical gestation for a human is roughly 36 to 40 weeks, so around about nine months, often broken down into trimesters of roughly 12 weeks each. When, um, I remember when my wife was pregnant, she got all these neat little things from her job, part of their like health program, whatnot. Um, got like a breast pump that was like $200, so that was awesome. But she got all these like hardcover books as well. And there was one that was kind of hilarious to me. Um, it was called The Happiest Baby. And I knew it was gonna be a great one because on the first page, it talked about how human or fetal gestation is actually incorrect. That babies really need to stay in the womb for a solid 12 months before they're ready to come out. So I was like, man, I'm, I'm in for a treat here. But yeah, nine months is really all you need. Now, the big thing with development is 27. 27 weeks is one of the major milestones you have because that is when a fetus can survive outside of the womb on their own. Once you reach roughly that 27 week mark, what do you think you can do on your own? I mean, you're all doing it now. Breathe. Yeah. So at 27 weeks, you can breathe. If you were born prematurely, and technically premature birth would be anything earlier than full gestation, but for the purposes here, if you're born before 27 weeks, you're going to be a very small birth weight, but you're not gonna be able to breathe on your, breathe on your own. You'll have to be ventilated artificially. So until that 27 week mark hits, you do not, or you're not viable, the child is not viable outside of the womb unless you have medical intervention. Everything else is going to grow rather quickly with development here. Your first critical period starts roughly at two to four weeks from conception. So neural tube development, remember what does the neural tube turn into? Is that like the spinal cord or the? Yeah, brain and spinal cord is what the neural tube turns into. Kind of hard to live without one of those. So the central nervous system is the first thing that begins being built as the embryo starts developing. Well, if you think about it though, I was saying most times you don't know you're pregnant for a little while. I mean, it's not as though the day after you know you're pregnant. This is why it's very tricky because with this start of neural tube development, anytime you have something wrong happen with the development of the embryo into the fetus, the earlier something wrong happens, the worse it is. So imagine, you know, obviously everyone starts from two cells and then rapid division and all that. But let's say you were at, I don't know, a, you were a four celled zygote right now and something went wrong with one of those cells, how much of your entire being is affected? 25%, yeah. Now, imagine then you continue development, but 25% of you is damaged. You see how that one cell damage early on replicates into terrible problems the bigger it gets. 
So the earlier some sort of defect happens, the worse off it is for you. The later something happens, usually the more correctable it is. We're going to talk about two primarily different complications with pregnancy, and that's going to be gestational diabetes and preeclampsia or hypertension. But here you see these critical periods. And like I said, the earlier you have something go wrong, the more severe it tends to be. And if you look at development, your big organs or organ systems are the first things to develop. If these can't develop, if your central nervous system or your neural tube and your heart can't develop, you do not have a viable pregnancy. So you may you know, hear sometimes of a baby being born without a brain. That actually can happen. If the neural tube does not develop, you can actually get full fetal development without actually being alive. And that would be something that would be found or discovered before you, know, you give birth. But that can happen. Obviously, that's not a viable fetus, even though the rest of the body develops. If you don't have a neural tube turning into your brain and spinal cord, if you don't have a brain, you cannot be kind of thing. So the critical periods early on are the much more important ones. Now, this isn't to say that if you, you know, didn't have ears, eyes, legs, and arms that things wouldn't be bad, but you can survive without those. Now, granted, your quality of life probably isn't going to be the best, but you really don't need them to survive per se. I mean, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but you get the idea. Your organ systems are much more important for your fetal development than our external things. Now, as you progress through gestation, really the major things that you have to watch out for are usually mechanical related. So usually things related to the, say, umbilical cord, if it gets, say, wrapped around the um, fetus's arm or leg, it can actually sever it, actually kind of acting like a tourniquet. You really can't cut off blood flow from the umbilical cord. That's very difficult to do. Um, there'd be a lot of complications. You, know, you would know something's way off with that. But it's very easy for the umbilical cord to wrap around a body part and essentially kill that body part. If you watch the show, I think it's Teen Mom or one of the spinoffs, um, one of the kids was born without an arm because of that reason. The umbilical cord wrapped around the arm and essentially killed the bottom half of his arm. So uh, that is something that may or may not be detectable, depending on, like, say, when you get an ultrasound, what the positioning of the ultrasound is, um, you know, the ability of, say, the ultrasound tech or your OB to read the results. So things like that do happen. But again, the earlier critical periods are the much more important ones. Now, important thing to remember is that the number one predictor of infant health is birth weight. The bigger the baby, the better. So typically, about seven-ish pounds is what you want to look for or greater for a newborn. Now, it's also going to be wet weight, meaning that when you are first born, you have a whole lot of fluids in your body, like in every orifice and whatnot. 
So a newborn will lose round about like a pound in the first couple days of life, clearing out all of those fluids. Um, but you wanna shoot for at least that seven pound mark. When you get into the 10 plus pound mark, that's when you tend to have difficulties with vaginal delivery because the baby is gonna be just too big. But you would much rather have a quote unquote overweight newborn than an underweight newborn. So this is a case where bigger is better. Like I talked about with the two different complications we're gonna look at with um, hypertension and gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is just maternal irregular glucose regulation. If you have pre-existing diabetes, you're still gonna most likely have diabetes during pregnancy. Anyone can really develop gestational diabetes and usually it goes away after delivery. So then once child's delivered, blood glucose levels better regulate and you're good to go. However, gestational diabetes can turn into type two diabetes. So you can get type two diabetes as a result of getting gestational diabetes. It's very important that you're closely monitoring your blood glucose levels during pregnancy if you are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So you want to make sure that your diet changes so that it's more friendly to your blood glucose levels. That's a major thing with that. Gestational hypertension can happen as well. So you may see the term preeclampsia. If you get high blood pressure during pregnancy, that is a very dangerous thing because it can cause issues for not only the mother, but the fetus as well. This is where say things like physical activity prior and during pregnancy can be really beneficial because that can help with better controlling blood pressure as you go on. And then being very diligent about consumption of things like stimulants are going to be another big factor with that. When you also look at complications, like I said, age of the mother plays a big role there. Too young or too old are generally not the best things. This is why I don't really particularly like the, the teen mom shows as much as my wife loves them because it kind of glamorizes, you know, teenage pregnancy and not taking away anything from, you know, the fact that they're young mothers, but looking at it from a strictly physiological perspective, you get, or you have one of the highest risks of complications and really birth defects and specifically fatal birth defects, the younger you are. So all females are or reach sexual maturity at roughly about a year before their first menstrual cycle or their first time that they menstruate, you'll start releasing viable eggs. However, the earlier on that you conceive, the kind of less prepared your body is for it. If you think about it, you know, if you were pregnant as a teenager, not only is a baby developing within you, you're still growing as a person physically. That's where you get a whole lot of problems going on because your body still is growing, but you have something inside you growing as well. It makes regulation and de normal development very tricky. When you're in college, you're at kind of your peak 
you know, fertility for females. Males kind of have it easy. Um, for the most part, as soon as males reach sexual maturity, they're kind of good to go until like their mid fifties. So unfortunately, most problems with fertility exist with females. The major thing with males is sperm count. So that's really the only kind of thing that can happen with males. With females, the other bad thing is that you all have a pre-existing number of eggs that are viable. You can't produce more, they only go down. The older you get, the less viable those eggs become. You know, the eggs you house within your ovaries age similarly to how you age as a person. You know, your body starts breaking down the older you get. Same thing happens with your eggs. So really mid twenties, well, early mid twenties up through mid thirties is really the best time for conception. It's usually the easiest in terms of like say complications. So you have the, le the least amount of chance of complications. After about 35, you start really sharply declining in your fertility for females. And then once you hit about age 40, that's where it's really problematic in terms of the potential for birth defects. Now, one of the big ones you will see is trisomy 23 or Down syndrome. It happens in about one out of every 100 live births in women over 40. And that breaks down to 1%, which you know isn't by any means a lot. But still, think about you know, if you were going to fly on a plane and you had a 1% chance of dying, would you fly on that plane? I mean, you think about how many hundreds of planes leave Sky Harbor every day. If you know, if you're guaranteed one of those is going to crash and burn, do you want to take any of those flights? So not to deter people from, you know, having children at advanced age, but the risk of complications does increase. The point there is, is that even though it's only 1%, in terms of complications, 1% is a very big number. Most complications you'll see, or birth defects you'll see, are fractions of a fraction of a percent. Like you're talking one out of several hundred, several thousand, tens of thousands, that kind of thing. So when you're talking about one out of 100, that's a very big number in terms of your statistical percentages of say a, a, a complication there. The other thing you may, that may come as kind of a surprise is this one out of 50 pregnancies, and again, this is for um, over 40 years, result in some sort of genetic abnormality. I had a, my, well actually my freshman biology teacher in high school tried to tell us that you could, if you had one sibling, that you could theoretically not be biologically related to them. And his rationale for it was that everyone has 46 chromosomes, right? You get 23 from mom, 23 from dad. And each parent has their own 46. So theoretically, if you got 23 from mom and then your sibling got the other 23 and the same thing happened with dad, that you would be theoretically not biologically related. However, that lacks, that, that kind of thought process lacks the basic understanding of actually how genetics works. Yes, that can happen as extremely unlikely as it is. You could have a completely separate set of chromosomes, not share any of that with a sibling, but everyone that comes from the same mother has to be genetically related. 
because only maternal inheritance or only mothers pass on mitochondrial DNA to the offspring. So it is only maternally inherited. Anything that happens with your metabolism or your mitochondria production, either thank or blame it on your mom. So everyone that comes from the same mother is automatically genetically related. I guess theoretically, if you had the same father, so if you were a step sibling, or I mean a half sibling, um, that you could theoretically not be genetically related. But yeah, that would be very, very difficult to do. But still, you get kind of the idea there. One of the concepts we'll look at here in a couple minutes is how mothers should eat during pregnancy. You may hear the term eating for two. Well, that's true, but it's not, it shouldn't be misconstrued as eating like two. So yeah, you do need to increase your caloric intake because you have that developing fetus in you, but it doesn't mean you go from say a 2000 calorie diet to a 4000 calorie diet. As much as a newborn or a, um, a fetus is developing and growing, they don't need the same amount of calories that a, that a full grown adult does. You're talking around about 500, 250 to 500 calories increase over what you're currently consuming during fetal development. You need around about 500 extra calories per day during lactation. So if you're breastfeeding, you need to have about an extra 500 calories for um, proper breast milk production. And that's just so you get the quantity of it. During the course of a pregnancy, the mother should gain around about 25 to 35 pounds ish. Most often the weight gain is going to really come on starting the second trimester. And during the first trimester, what do you think is going to limit weight gain? Yeah, what would limit maternal weight gain during the first trimester? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you all, but whenever I'm vomiting, I don't think that that's the best time for me to like, you know, be ordering a pizza kind of thing. So morning sickness typically occurs during the first trimester. And granted, my only personal experience is what my wife went through. <clears throat> And she had a relatively easy pregnancy, but she still had some morning sickness and she ended up losing round about 20 pounds her first trimester. Like I was telling her, it was like joking. It was like, man, having a kid's probably like the best weight loss thing you could have ever done. She didn't find that too amusing, but um, then she gained quite a bit once that all leveled out. So really when you hit about that second trimester is really when the weight gain starts. And if you think about it, when you're in your first trimester, this is kind of a misleading image here of the size of the child. Really that child is kind of no bigger than like a golf ball at most during your first trimester. So even if you're not putting on tons of weight or able to consume excessive calories, you don't really need to. It's once you hit that second and third trimester is when you really need to make sure that your calories are increasing because that's when the biggest expansion occurs or the biggest growth of the fetus occurs. You should round about 
get three and a half ish pounds during the first trimester, ideally, and then about a pound a week thereafter. About two thirds of the weight you put on is going to be contained within your uterus. So if you really look here, your amniotic fluid, infant birth weight, uterine size, and then blood supply and placenta, all of that is going to add up to around about 20 pounds. So you're losing a ton of weight really in the about a week or two after delivery. I mean, immediately you're losing that seven, eight-ish pounds from the child being born. You're losing all that amniotic fluid. And yeah, that exits rapidly. I had to get myself a new pair of shoes after my kid was born. This here, increase in blood supply to the placenta and increase in mother's fluid volume. Why do you think that happens? Pregnant women are essentially the best blood dopers there are in anything. Typical adult has around about five to six liters of blood in them. A pregnant woman will increase their blood supply to around about seven to nine liters, maybe even a little bit more. Why do you think that happens? Is providing oxygen to the fetus. Yeah. If we look back here, all this is fetal blood supply. You need to increase greatly the amount of blood you have to support the growing fetus. So, just even in and around the uterus, you have tons of extra blood. It's not uncommon to have even kind of somewhat severe vaginal bleeding like during even gestation because you have so much extra blood that's filling in the, in the uterus there. Now, that also can be a sign of miscarriage. So, you know, that can be a bad thing, but it's also not something that you should lose all hope with if that were to happen. And then I don't know how much is too much, but, or to share, I should say, but uh, you know, after delivery, you do continue losing fluids for, um, several days to about a week. So you'll get these things called um, pregnancy pads, which essentially are like huge boats of like what a normal period pad would be. And uh, yeah, those fill up quite substantially. <laughs> now, you'll also see that the mother's going to have a whole bunch of fat stores increasing. Now, remember that females naturally are going to have about 10 ish percent more body fat than a male would in a given same body type. Most all of that is because of females having more estrogen, less testosterone, your breast tissue 
is mostly all fat. But when you're gestating, you're going to put on a considerable amount of extra fat because that's going to be what's needed to help support lactation or breast milk production. So in terms of, say, baby weight that you don't immediately lose, the fat store increase and the increase in breast size, those are going to be the two big ones that are the baby weight you won't immediately lose. You really shouldn't get back to your pre-pregnancy weight until really like six to 12 months after delivery, just because if you're, and, and that is with a caveat that you're breastfeeding, because if you're breastfeeding, you don't want to be losing weight necessarily. You want to maintain what you do have so that you maintain good breast milk production. So a lot of that fat goes into not only helping with the breast milk production, but it also goes into helping with what's actually in the breast milk itself, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Now with physical activity and exercise, pregnant women should follow the gui guidelines from ACOG. ACOG is your American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology. When you look for, like, say, disease management or even just apparently healthy adult recommendations, you go to the ACSM or American College of Sports Medicine. They defer to ACOG for pregnancy. When you're pregnant, exercise is really good. However, the kind of exercise you do is pretty important. You should stay active you shouldn't be trying to run a marathon. So it always kind of irks me when I see like Instagram stories of say, you know, third trimester women trying to do their own like personal record on like say some sort of power lifting or something like that. That's not really the healthiest, safest thing to do. Staying active and exercising throughout pregnancy, very good. High intensity, high impact exercise, not recommended. You wanna keep lower impact on there. You also don't want to be doing heavy weightlifting because heavy weightlifting is going to really cause fluctuations in your blood pressure. If you lift something that's extremely heavy, your blood pressure is gonna shoot way up. Well, what happens when you drop that weight? What then happens to your blood pressure? Yeah, it's going to just collapse back down. Some of the um, biggest, or I should say strongest power lifters, they'll increase their blood pressure during a max lift to round about like 450 over 200. You think normal blood pressure 120 over 80? Emergency level like 200 over 100? But normal like max strength powerlifting can get in the 400s over 200s. This is why if you ever watch like YouTube videos of people trying to do a thousand pound deadlift or 1500 pound squat or whatever, you see them do it and then immediately they pass out afterward. And it's because they have a huge spike in blood pressure and then a huge drop off in the blood pressure as soon as the weight's gone. That can be very problematic. Well, imagine you're pregnant doing that. That blood pressure can affect the fetus as well not even just like say the mechanical impact it could have. I mean, you never really want to take like a direct fall onto your stomach kind of thing, but what happens to the mother is going to also happen to the fetus. If you've um, 
followed some of the recent COVID developments, there was an article that recently came out of, I believe, Hong Kong, where a newborn tested positive for COVID antibodies, which previously wasn't thought to be able to happen. For the most part, viruses aren't very easily transmitted over the blood uterine barrier. Most likely like say, like one of the bigger concerns for say vaginal birth is if the mother has HIV because once the baby leaves the uterus, the vaginal canal can expose them to HIV. So many times, I think most times actually, women who have HIV, pregnant women who have HIV will have a C-section to avoid that. Most, like I said, viruses aren't going to be transmitted to the fetus, especially in utero. So to see something like that happen is kind of groundbreaking that that can happen. That can potentially set up you know, future treatments or it could even you know, really change the game in terms, in terms of the way we understand the way that the mother-fetus relationship works in terms of nutrient supply and what we could possibly do to maybe help treat future diseases out of that. So back to exercise here. Like I said, exercise always good unless you have complications. Kind of true with all life, right? Everything's good for you until it isn't. The most important thing for pregnant women to do in terms of physical activity and exercise is just to do it. Do something. Stretching is gonna be very helpful. That is going to help with say future ease of delivery. You want to try to strengthen the pelvic floor. So there, there's muscles in the bottom of your pelvis called your pelvic floor. That can again also help with delivery and also can help with kind of your quality of really your pregnancy. You don't want to be trying to put on tons of like muscle or anything like that. So while strength training is still a good idea, it needs to be done at a low intensity level. Everything really low intensity or lower intensity. Do walking, don't run. Don't be doing plyometrics. So like running around, jumping, not the best thing for you to do. So the lower the impact you can do, the better. Lower intensity, longer duration, better. One of the things I always found interesting here is the uh, don't don't scuba dive. Why do you think that would be problematic? Yeah. Whenever you go underwater, you have all of that extra atmospheric pressure from the water pushing down on you. So if you're going in the water, stay at surface level. That's gonna be the best thing for you. Swimming's really good. Diving is really bad. <laughs> so stay at surface level. And then here's all this nice other goods and bads that you can have. All right, now what are we actually eating? What do we actually need? Here's kind of your big six for what you need for pregnancy. 
Number one by far and away is folic acid or folate. And after seeing how these critical periods work, I hope that kind of clicks with you why folate is so important. Assuming that you believe me that folate helps to actually reduce the incidence of neural tube defects. The neural tube, again, which forms into your brain spinal cord, is the first thing to develop. If that doesn't develop, you do not live. So folate not only is that important during pregnancy, but it's also very important prior to pregnancy. All prenatal vitamins should have at least 400 micrograms of folate in them or folic acid in them. If you ever see a prenatal vitamin that does not have at least that much, it's not good or it's not gonna be what you need. If you look with folate, where you're getting it, spinach, broccoli, asparagus, I mean, that's all stuff I like. I mean, I love eating asparagus. I grow my own asparagus. Spinach is good, I like that. Broccoli, another one. But how much are you all going to be eating those three every day, you know? I mean, I guess if you're consuming, you know, a head of broccoli and ranch as kind of your own mini vegetable tray every day. But this is really one of the times where supplements are important. Remember that just by definition, a supplement is something that's going to enhance your overall diet. It's going to help give you what you don't have through your diet. Folate is somewhat hard to come by in a normal diet because of how much of these specific kind of leafy greens you need to consume to really get everything you need. The other one is going to be Well, I don't have iron in here, but iron's one of them as well. With proteins and healthy fats, those are going to be really something that goes hand in hand. Why do you think, say, like lean meats are going to be something much more recommended than just whatever protein you can get? less saturated fat. Our unsaturated fat is good for us. I mean, everything in moderation. You know, if you just lived off of fats, that's not gonna be good, but in moderation, yeah, still good. The unsaturated fats tend to be the ones that are going to impact a lot of our cardiovascular processes. So saturated fats can increase your LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol which can clog your arteries. You can potentially get higher blood pressure from it. So you have to think of what's the trickle down effect or what's the domino effect there. If mother gets high blood pressure, what impact does that have on the fetus? So this is where really maintaining a almost kind of a DASH diet is important or a Mediterranean kind of diet. You really wanna limit those saturated fats. You also want to be limiting really your sugar intake, specifically like your added sugar intake. So what's one food that like most pregnant women crave?
Like a protein? No, of anything. Pickles? Yeah, pickles. And how would you describe the taste profile of a pickle? Salty. Salty, yeah. The female body actually tries to help protect you against or, or protect herself against really glucose imbalances because you'll release certain hormones that will change really your palate or it'll change, it'll change really your taste preferences. And it changes it to go from sweet to salty. So pregnant women do usually crave more salty based foods, which is a good thing. You would much rather have those because the risk of say developing high blood pressure from excessive sodium intake is minimized because your fluid intake is going to increase, your fluids are going to increase, which are, means your salt intake is needed to increase. So because your overall fluid volume, blood volume and plasma volume increases, you need more sodium to house that extra blood. What you don't need is the extra sugars So in part, your body does itself a favor by releasing hormones to signal that you want to eat salty foods instead of sweet foods. And if you think about it, you really don't see pregnant women, for the most part, like chowing down on sweet, sugary stuff. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, but in terms of you know, kind of being a stereotype, most pregnant women will skew towards the saltier foods and stay largely away from the sweet ones. I mean, again, I can only kind of speak anecdotally about my experience, but my wife loves chocolate ice cream. Like her favorite thing is the um, chocolate devotion from Cold Stone. I think that's what it's called. She was like repulsed by chocolate during her pregnancy or repulsed by ice cream during her pregnancy. Like she tried to eat it once and like threw up and that was it. No more ice cream. I mean, which was kind of good for me because then, you know, I didn't eat it. So it kind of helped me. But like I said, pregnant women will skew more towards the saltier foods because of hormonal re releases. I've said that about five times now, so hopefully that triggers some sort of bell for you. This here is an interesting little stat. You may hear of pregnant women saying that they feel much more energetic, especially after getting rid of the morning sickness issue. Usually around the second trimester, when morning sickness is kind of gone, women will become much more energetic. And it all has to do with this sharp increase in their BMR. Pregnant women are going to increase their metabolism at superhuman levels. I've talked before about how, like say, if you're a smoker, you have around about a four to 5% faster metabolism than a non-smoker. I mean, you know, cardiorespiratory issues aside, smoking is going to increase your metabolism. So it's good for you in that regard. I mean, bad for you overall, but if you wanna raise your metabolism, smoking is a way you could theoretically do it. The levels that are being increased here by pregnant women are stuff you can't naturally achieve. Any type of central nervous system stimulant you take is going to increase your BMR. 
So like even caffeine will increase it by a couple percent, but nothing too terribly big. If you're doing like cocaine or meth, you can get up to around like 10 to 12%, but obviously those carry their own list of problems. So pregnant women really are kind of like superheroes. They are making their, I mean, they themselves don't do it, but their bodies increase their metabolism to a point that should not be able to be achieved. And why do you think that happens? Yeah, pretty much. In its simplest form, like if, and, and please hope you don't take offense to this, but in its simplest form, all a fetus is, is a parasite. It is just something that is growing within a female, relying on the female exclusively for all of its sustenance. Well, if you are just you all right now and you just have to maintain your own life, that's great and all, but now add a second smaller life inside of you. And now to not only run yourself, but build that other one, you have to work that much harder. So your metabolism increases substantially to help with accommodating more of that growth of the fetus. The kind of parasitic nature of a fetus requires excessive energy production to grow. So that's really the main reason why you're having it there. Now, I want to kind of clarify here why this doesn't list iron, and I said that iron's an important thing because this is a pre-pregnancy diet. If you notice here, iron is something that will greatly increase in need during pregnancy, but it sharply declines after pregnancy. Why the fluctuation in iron? Like you said, there's all that blood that's like from the uterus that's supplying nutrients, and then after you give birth, you're lactating, you don't have anything in your uterus anymore to supply all the nutrients to. Exactly. The increase in iron requirements during pregnancy are a direct result of the increase in blood volume that a pregnant woman experiences. This is why pre pregnancy, iron, I mean, it's still important, but it's not something that you need excessive amounts of. During pregnancy, when you get all that extra blood, you need iron in there. Iron binds to hemoglobin, which will bind to oxygen, carrying oxygen to whatever tissue is it's needed. After delivery, so in the postpartum period, all of that blood starts going away. So then you no longer have a need for it. So your iron needs actually drop to even less than what your pre-pregnancy levels were. We have a hard time storing iron, especially during pregnancy. So that's why you kind of need a whole lot more iron with it. This here, the protein requirement too. You need additional protein because all growth, like all physical growth involves protein synthesis. But 
it's discouraged to use supplements. Supplements meaning like a protein supplement. The whole reason behind that, I won't even make you guess, is because it can put excessive strain on the kidneys. A pregnant woman's body is already kind of stressed to the max. You don't want to do anything else that's going to possibly tip that over the edge into something terrible. So you want to be getting your additional proteins through natural sources or through food-based sources. Typically, your lean meats, a lot of your vegetables will have a lot of those proteins you need. Malnutrition and risky behaviors, these are very common reasons why you're gonna have problems or complications with pregnancy. There is no acceptable amount of alcohol that should be consumed by pregnant women. So it used to be that pregnant women could consume like a glass or a half a glass of red wine or something like that. Um, now the, after more study to it, finding that that still increases the risks of like to feel developments and possible birth defects. So you shouldn't have any alcohol when you're pregnant. You shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't be doing illicit drugs. There's actually a bunch of drugs, like even just med medications that can have negative interactions with the fetus. So typically like your only painkiller is Tylenol, like during pregnancy. Things even like ibuprofen, Aleve, those can all ha cause problems with the fetus. So, you know, if you have a headache or if you're hurt, get some Tylenol. That's about all you get, unfortunately. Opioids are a very easy thing to transmit to the fetus. So, if you either consume, use, whatever, any kind of opioid or morphine-based type of drug, that can be very, very damaging to the fetus. You can actually get a child be born addicted to opiates, essentially. So you may hear the term like say, um, like something along the lines of like a heroin addicted baby. That is something that does happen, unfortunately. And when the child's born, it's born already addicted to opiates. So it's actually, go, it goes through severe withdrawals during its first, like its early days, weeks of life, which is pretty sad. Now, the other thing too, is that you should be kind of avoiding caffeine. Most all these central nervous system stimulants can be problematic really for a number of reasons, but stimulants can pass through to the fetus a lot easier than most others. You have any idea how fast the fetal heartbeat is? How much? Yeah, roughly. Very high. That's at rest. You're talking anywhere from roughly 130 to 150. Average adult resting heart rate, 75. So a fetus is beating at about twice, roughly, the speed that the mother is. Add a stimulant into there. Now, that's going even faster. Even though you go that fast because the heart's so small, eventually it's gonna to go too fast. You know, you ever run down a hill? If you're running down a hill and you don't slow yourself down, eventually you're gonna to go too fast and fall over. That's kind of what happens with overconsumption of stimulants during pregnancy. So that can cause heart problems. 
especially to the fetus. So low intakes seem to be okay. Even though they're generally recognized as safe, it's one of those things like, okay, I'm not gonna yell at my wife for having a cup of coffee once in a while. I mean, if she tried to have a pot of it, yeah, probably have some issues. But ideally you wanna just kind of limit that stuff. So usually like a cup of coffee, like less than 100 milligrams of caffeine is generally recognized as okay. But it's one of those things like, do you really wanna risk it? I don't mean to fear monger, but at the same time, you know, why risk it for so little reward kind of thing? Because mm -hmm. it's almost like how drug addicts are too, except they're not like itching for it, they just have like yeah, so a caffeine withdrawal is mild compared to like other major drugs. You can go cold turkey from caffeine and be physiologically fine. You can't go cold turkey from opioids or alcohol. You can actually kill yourself. You have to wean yourself off of it. But obviously that's a big difference. But if you are going off of caffeine, Weaning yourself does help a whole lot, but really the major side effects or complications you would see of just abruptly quitting caffeine really are more inconveniences and annoyances than anything. So you're going to have potential, you know, like agitation, you can have either periods of like say restlessness or periods of lethargy, um, headaches or another one, but all of those are pretty benign. It's mostly about kind of like just really pure willpower to do it because there's not really anything like you don't have a essentially a drug to help detox you from caffeine or get you off of caffeine. It's not like you're taking Suboxone to get off of, you know, heroin kind of thing. But yeah, it's an inconvenience, but it's something that it's, I mean, it's not gonna kill you to do it. I would recommend like if you were a heavy caffeine consumer to wean yourself off, cause that'll make it easier to sustain. You wouldn't want to like, you know, if you're, if you go straight cold turkey with it and you feel like a bad headache or you feel, you know, any of those symptoms, you're much more likely to then just go back to doing it so you relieve those symptoms, even though you know that it's not the best thing to do. When we talk about risk mitigation, you know, you look at, let's say, someone was smoking a pack a day and drinking a pot of coffee a day and then becomes pregnant. I'd be okay with them continuing the pot of coffee a day if they were willing to give up cigarettes. So in terms of risk mitigation, caffeine's low on the list. Like I'd much rather you keep that and then get rid of other risky behaviors. But we're kind of getting into my own like personal opinion there as opposed to anything. All right. So that's really everything I wanted to cover here today. Um, what we'll get into next week is everything postpartum. So we'll start into that with lactation and then when the newborn or infant actually starts eating on their own, working up through advanced age. Any questions on anything we covered today? I know it's pretty extensive with all the different stuff, but what you should remember is increase in calories round about 250 to 500 calorie increase. You want to increase proteins. Do not use protein supplements. Make sure you increase folic acid intake to at least 400 micrograms a day 
even prior to pregnancy. The whole neural tube development. Remember what your critical periods are. Remember critical periods are the major growth or major development of body systems. And then obviously your you know, risky behaviors, make sure you limit those or get rid of those if possible. And then increase iron when you're pregnant. Drop it off when you're not. So yeah, so that's everything I got for you there. So thank you all for getting through that with me. And then if you guys don't have any more questions, you are all good to go. So I'll let you out a few minutes early. And then I will see you all here next week.